All right, so um, <clears throat> I've been getting some uh, some uh, questions um, for you guys from you guys about uh, the analysis piece, and hopefully um, my answers have been clearing that up. Uh, most of the questions have been around um, like what exactly I'm looking for structure wise or word count or formatting. And I mean, the short answer is really like, I'm not looking for anything. Like basically what I'm just looking for is you guys to um, make a case for whatever you think in terms of um, how well the, the government did incorporating the suggestions and just um, argue your case in a convincing way. I'm not interested in, like, I, I don't, I don't even have a marking guide for this thing. Like everybody's, um, everybody's is, uh, you know, is marked um, differently depending on how well they they argue their points. So it's really um, the assignment's probably much more open than than what you're used to. Um, but I made it that way on purpose because I want you guys to think about this stuff. Um, and so. Yeah, so that's, so don't worry about formatting. Don't worry about um, any of that stuff. You can have headings, you can not have headings. Um, it's just, it's really up to you um, to just make the assignment um, and construct it and format it however you think um, makes your case uh, the strongest that you can make it. Um, and the reason why I did it that way is because I'm hoping that you guys will sort of like, take an interest in this um, above and beyond just fulfilling uh, an assignment and really think about this stuff. So I don't know, maybe that's not what you're used to, or maybe that makes things a little bit difficult, but um, that's kind of what where I'm at with that assignment. So um, if you I can continue answering questions if you have email and stuff, but um, or if you want to email them to me and, and things, but um, yeah, a lot of the questions seem to be about what exactly I'm looking for. And um, I'm looking for you to um, tell me what you think, basically. Um, so does that make sense? Um, and, and I think, uh, yeah, some of the, um, most of the questions will have fallen into that kind of category. Like a lot of people are saying, well, I've read, I've read the, the review and I've read the drug policy and I just really don't know what you're looking for. And my advice to you is just to start writing something like just, just get into the assignment, um, start thinking about those suggestions and what the policy is proposing to do and whether or not those things line up and how well they line up. And if you have any suggestions for things that aren't there, it's really just about what your take is on this. Um, so, Hopefully that clears it up, um, but yeah, keep the emails coming. You have until um, Sunday night to, to submit it um, on Blackboard. There should be a link that comes, uh, that's up there. Um, <clears throat> and um, the other thing um, is, oh yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know that you probably have received an email from the university about uh, like a course evaluation kind of thing. So you have a couple of weeks to fill that out. If you could do that, that would help me um, sort of figure out how I'm doing in the class um, and give me suggestions for improvement and be completely honest. You know, um, if there are things that you love about the course, let me know. If there are things that you hate about it, let me know. Um, and I'll do my best to keep uh, incorporating your feedback in um, to future um, semesters and, and years of the class. Um, okay, so today's, uh, this week's lecture, um, <clears throat> we've, what we've been talking about throughout the semester is um, these ideas about drug use and addiction, right? So we've, we've taken kind of a real broad view. We've looked at some of the kind of historical um, and social and political um, factors having to do with ideas and policy around addiction. And we've looked at some of the ways that these drugs sort of act in the brain. 
so that we can sort of try to get an idea what addiction looks like from a neurophysiological um, perspective. Um, <clears throat> and the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about ideas around sort of theories and models of addiction. Um, <clears throat> and I, um, I've tried to do this to kind of set the stage for this last week of lectures, which is, um, for me, trying to understand kind of the broad social and political context of addiction. Okay, so things like the, the brain disease model of addiction takes a very kind of specific perspective around how drugs um, interact with, you know, maybe a genetic predisposition or change the way that our brain functions and put us into this pathway um, of dependence and addiction. And we've discussed some of the issues around that sort of characterization. Um, but what I want to talk about today is a little bit, so something more a little bit general, which is kind of trying to set um, to, to understand the context in which we see addiction happen. So we know that in some, some groups and some populations, addiction is much more prevalent, right? Um, and, it's, and some of that can be tied to genetics and some of it can't. But um, what I want to look at today is whether or not we can point to something more general about um, social um, contexts or socioeconomic contexts that can actually um, account for the prevalence of addiction. So we'll see how well I do. I don't know, maybe what you guys won't be convinced, but what I'm gonna try to do um, this, this lecture is basically do three things. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to, uh, we're going to talk about this idea of dislocation, which you should be familiar with now that you've um, read the, the reading for this week by Bruce Alexander. Um, and the optional reading is this book here um, called The Globalization of Addiction, which he wrote um, several years ago, which is a real deep dive into the kind of stuff that he wrote about in, in the reading. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about dislocation and show how it sets the context for addiction. I want to talk about um, capitalism, free market capitalism. One of my friends pointed out that, well, there's no such thing as free market capitalism because the government always interferes, right? And I said, okay, well, now you're just, um, you know, making, the, you're, you're being too idiosyncratic. But capitalism, um, I want to talk about how it's led to dislocation on a massive scale throughout history and is doing so um, today. And then I want to um, try to give you guys an empirical um, analysis of a situation where I think you can point to specific effects of um, a capitalist society which has resulted in very increased rates of addiction in the relatively recent past, okay? Um, so yeah, it's a big, I have a, I have a big goal for this and we'll see how well I do. Um, <clears throat> but we first need to talk about dislocation. So what's dislocation? Um, well, dislocation uh, has, it's, we're not talking about, you know, dislocated um, joints or elbows or shoulders or anything like that. We're talking, this is, this is a psychological concept, okay? So to live in society, to live in the world, um, in relationships, living full, being flourishing, you know, having a full life that's full of joy and, and um, meaningful relationships requires um, people to be psychosocially integrated, okay? Um, and um, what, what we need to do um, in order to do that is um, being fully and, and reciprocally integrated in your social, familial, and cultural relationships, okay? Um, so you, you have these networks of people that you have relationships with and you need, to have, um, you need to have strong relationships. You need to be understood by those people. You need to understand them um, in order to, to be this, uh, what's called psychosocially integrated. 
And this type of integration is a critical aspect of health. I mean, you can take courses on this, right? And then there's a lot of health psychology um, that deals with this kind of thing. Um, any kind of counseling um, uh, discipline will, will underline the importance of this type of integration, right? People who are not integrated like this, um, they just don't do well. We don't do well as humans um, when we're not integrated in, into our social um, context. So <clears throat> this is a, a quote from the Alexander reading. Um, insufficient psychosocial integration can be called dislocation, okay? So that's what he, that's how he refers to it. Um, severe prolonged dislocation is hard to endure. When forced upon people, dislocation, um, whether by ostracism, excommunication, exile, or solitary confinement is so onerous that it has been used as a um, form of punishment from ancient times until the present. And severe prolonged dislocation regularly leads to suicide. So this is not some, we're not talking about people who feel a little bit on the outside of things. We're talking about when people feel completely dislocated from the social um, and relationship context in their life to such an extent that they, um, they can't actually deal with it. It's a very, um, a very difficult um, situation to find yourself in. Well, so what does it have to do with addiction? Okay, so this is the big question. And these are the kind of questions that are being asked by some psychologists and psychiatrists who are not really um, sort of in the mainstream um, in terms of uh, models of addiction, uh, models of child development and things like that, these people are, are well known for, but um, they're not kind of the neuroscientists who are you know, in the news and, and stuff um, regarding addiction. So what does it have to do with addiction? There's, there's um, a number of ideas um, here. So the, one, one thing that you guys might've heard of, and I mentioned in here, and it mentions it in the, in the Bruce Alexander paper, and it's kind of become a, a lot more um, well-known and more famous um, in recent years is this idea of Rat Park, right? There's this experiment um, conducted by this guy, um, a Canadian uh, psychologist named Bruce Alexander in the 1970s. Um, and what he's basically doing is um, a response to Nixon's war on drugs, right? Where we're just, um, we're just talking about drugs now as this great evil where we're um, assigning all of the, these um, addictive qualities to drugs in and of themselves, right? And we're saying that um, we're starting to criminalize a lot of the people who do drugs. And so there's this, this kind of idea, these kind of ideas going around in society. And um, Bruce Alexander and, and other people are, are kind of saying, well, we're kind of getting, we're focusing too much on one thing and we're forgetting the context in which this happens, right? So. What he did was he conducted a very simple experiment and some people would say too simple and some people would say sloppy. Um, but um, the experiment was basically looking at, uh, he wanted to look at addiction um, to morphine. And he wanted, he, what he did was he assessed whether the rats um, quote unquote addiction to morphine depended on the environment. So he set up a real simple um, experiment and he took advantage of the fact that most of the experiments that had been done and, and that are still done, um, to be honest, when looking at addiction and self-administration, um, they isolate the rats, right? They put them um, by themselves in a cage um, where the only thing that they have access to in the cage is the drug, <laughs> right? So they, they remove them from any kind of um, uh, social or natural kind of relationships, and they put them in this situation where all they have access to is the drug. And lo and behold, they find that a rat in that situation will drink, um, you know, uh, will self-administer the drug and become addicted sometimes to the point of doing that, um, to the point of killing themselves, right? And so Alexander was saying, okay, well, this, um, this is a, a real artificial situation, right? Um, or, or, or if it's not artificial, it's looking at a very specific context that um, doesn't necessarily mirror the, the range of contexts that people find themselves in in life, right? Um, 
And so what he wanted to do is say, okay, well, if we take the rat out of this type of an environment and we put them in what this place called Rat Park, right? Which he built, which is this big, big cage, a big um, system of rooms and, and cages that had all these toys, a whole bunch of different rats hanging out together, all kinds of food, um, all of this stuff. And then if you give um, the rat a choice between drinking water that's laced with morphine and regular water, they don't become addicted to the morphine and they don't necessarily choose it more than they do the regular water, right? Um, and so the whole idea of this experiment was to see whether or not the social and environmental context could affect um, the addiction of these rats. Um, and so he ran this experiment and found, you know, rats in isolation took much more morphine than rats in rat park. And he suggested that this was evidence that the drugs weren't responsible for the addiction and, in, and that environment played a causal role. Okay, um, now there's been a lot of people who have sort of sworn by this experiment over the years and said, nope, this is the gold standard here. But um, the results have been pretty controversial. All right, we'd be, we'd be disingenuous if we didn't um, admit that and if we didn't point out the fact that um, as an experiment, this thing was run kind of sloppily, okay? For one, um, he had some equipment malfunctions, which he lost data for around a week and a half. Um, which, you know, is, could be viewed as like kind of this fatal flaw. A number of people have tried to replicate his findings and haven't been able to. Um, some people have been able to replicate his findings, but the idea um, that, so some have viewed those experiments as flawed and so unable to account for the complexity of, of addiction, just like saying that drugs produce addiction saying that an environment produces an addiction is too simplistic, right? Um, which there's probably some truth to that. Um, <clears throat> but I think the one of the reasons why um, Rat Park has, has become more and more um, popular and is entering sort of the public consciousness is because of the society that we live in these days um, tends to, to alienate us and to isolate us um, quite a bit more than maybe in, in previous generations. And so this, this kind of an account is starting to resonate more um, <clears throat> with people. And it, it, it fits intuitively with, with our idea of an addict, right? Um, this rat park. So you put a rat, you isolate a rat in a cage with no one to interact with, with no option but drugs, um, no relationships. They're gonna take drugs and they're gonna become addicted. Well, if we think about that, well, that kind of fits with our idea of a quote unquote addict, right? Like these people are, we think of them maybe as loners, isolated, they don't have any friends or they only have friends that they use with. Um, their drug habit um, causes them to burn all of their bridges, right? They, they don't have good relationships with people. They don't have options. They can't stay in jobs, right? So we basically, they put themselves in that cage. Um, or with, they find themselves in that cage. Did somebody have a question? No, okay. Um, so it fits intuitively with our idea of what an addict might be, right? But the question is, and this is this is why some people have had an issue with um, Alexander's um, ideas is, does it fit the data, right? Can you actually, can you show this empirically in a way that is um, scientifically convincing? And the, of course, what we have here is a chicken and egg problem, right? Because, because people who are isolated might become, might be more prone to addiction or when you get addicted and you start burning bridges and you know getting fired from jobs and all that stuff, that leads to isolation, right? So which, which comes first? Does the dislocation and isolation come first or does addiction make people dislocated um, and isolated? Well, <clears throat> there's, um, like I said, there's a number of, of, of people um, who, are, who are doing this, this kind of work um, 
And uh, some of the ideas around attachment theory of child development um, have come into play in this regard. So, um, like I said before, this dislocation or this, um, this psychosocial integration is very important um, for people to, to um, be able to live adaptively in society. An inability to form functional and recipro reciprocal relationships with other people in society can contribute to addiction. And um, one, um, one person, um, one psychologist says um, that this can actually start from a young age. And so I wanna show you um, a video that he has. And I just wanna say, um, I'm not sure if I totally buy into his complete and total um, account of this as um, being uh, having to do with child development, but I think it'll, it'll nevertheless give us some um, good insights into the kind of thinking that people have around this. So let me just um, uh, get into this video here. You guys see that okay? All right, I'm gonna turn it up as well. So we can all hear. All right, so this guy's name is Gabor uh, Mate, um, and he's a developmental psychologist. Um, and so, yeah, this is what he says about attachment um, and addiction. So an addiction is a complex psychological physiological process but which manifests in any behavior, any behavior that a person enjoys, that a person enjoys, finds relief in, and therefore craves in the short term, but suffers negative consequences in the long term and doesn't give up despite the negative consequences. So craving pleasure relief in the short term, negative consequences in the long term, inability to give it up. Now notice I has said nothing about substances. I said any behavior. So it could be related to cocaine, crystal meth, heroin, fentanyl, marijuana, nicotine, alcohol, whatever. Could also be sex, gambling, internet, relationships, shopping, eating, work, extreme sports, working out, um, pornography, any number of uh, human activities. So I said any behavior. Now, the official definition of addiction, according to the American um, Society for Addiction Medicine, is that this is primary a brain, it's a primary brain disorder. It arises in the brain, well, largely due to genetic reasons. This is how they see it. And I say that's just not true. Uh, the other popular idea of addiction is that it's a choice that somebody makes, that people choose to be addicted, which is what the legal system is based on. Because if people are not choosing, what are we punishing them for? And, and, uh, Although I think the medical definition is closer to the truth, I don't see it as a genetic, it's a genetic disorder, and I don't see it as a primary brain disorder. So let me perhaps show you why, if that's okay. A human being has two fundamental needs, apart from the physical needs in infancy and childhood. One is for attachment. <clears throat> now, attachment is the closeness and proximity with another human being for the sake of being looked after, or for the sake of looking after the other. Now, human beings, as mammals and even birds, are creatures of attachment. We have to connect and attach because otherwise we don't survive. If there's nobody that's motivated to take care of us, to attach to us that way, and we're not motivated to attach to others, we just can't survive. One of the interesting things is that the endorphins, which um, are the body's internal opiate uh, chemicals, which heroin and all the other opiates resemble, they have to facilitate attachment. So if you take infant mice and you knock out their endorphin receptors so they don't have endorphin opiate activity in their brain, they won't cry for help and separate from their mothers, which would mean that they would die in the wild. And which goes back to what happens in early in childhood when there's stress and trauma, these, uh, these endorphin systems don't develop. And then when people do heroin, it feels like a warm, soft hug to them. They feel love and connection for the first time. That's why it's so powerful. But so we have this need for attachment, without which obviously the human infant, who is the most helpless, the most dependent, the least mature of any creature in the universe at birth, uh, 
cannot survive without the attachment. And that attachment relationship, given that we have the longest period of development of any creature, you know, well into adolescence and, and beyond, attachment is not a negotiable need. But we have another need, which is authenticity. Now, authenticity, out of the self, means being connected to ourselves. Just knowing what we feel and being able to act on it. So, that means I've got feelings. So, let's look at how human beings evolved. For hundreds of thousands of years, and for 100,000 years or so, this species existing on Earth, how did we live? We didn't live in cities and houses and so on. We lived out there in the wild until very recently in human um, existence. Now, just how long do you survive in the wild if you're not connected to your gut feelings? Not very long. If you start using your intellect instead of your gut feelings, you just don't survive. So that's a powerful survival need as well. So attachment is a survival need. Authenticity is a survival need. But what happens if your authenticity threatens your attachment relationships? For example, as a two-year-old, you get angry because you didn't get the cookie before dinner. But your parents can't handle anger because they grew up in homes when there was rage of housing and they're terrified at the very expression of anger. So they give you the message that good little kids don't get angry. The message you receive is not that good little kids don't get angry, but that angry little kids don't get loved. Because your parents are now sullen, they won't look at you, they talk to you in a harsh way, you're not getting loved. Not experiencing love at that moment. No. But you gotta stay attached. Guess what you're gonna suppress? The authenticity every time. And this is how we lose connection to ourselves and to our gut feelings. So that, strangely enough, that very dynamic, which is essential for human survival in a natural setting, not becomes a threat to our survival in this, in this more modern setting, where to stay authentic is to threaten attachment. And so we give up our authenticity, and then we wonder who the hell we are, and whose life is this, and who's experiencing all this, and this life doesn't, you know, and who am I really? And so that's where the reconnection has to happen. That's where the healing happens, is with that reconnection. But it's because of that conflict, that tragic conflict in childhood between authenticity and attachment that most of us face, that we lose ourselves and lose connection to the gut feelings. Now, this leads to the, uh, the question of trauma, because it's one thing to recognize that all this originates in childhood pain. It's quite another to transform that pain. And for that, we have to understand what trauma is. So people often think that trauma is what happens to you. So trauma is a divorce when you were small and your parents fighting. Trauma is your mother's depression. Trauma is your father's alcoholism. Trauma is your parents' argumentation. Trauma is physical or sexual abuse or some loss. Those aren't the traumas. Those are traumatic. But the trauma is not what happens to you. The trauma is what happens inside you. And as a result of these traumatic events, what happens inside you is you get, you get disconnected from your emotions and you disconnect from your body. And you have difficulty being in the present moment. And you develop a negative view of your world and a negative view of yourself and a defensive view of other people. And these perspectives keep showing up in your life in the present. So in other words, the addiction is not the primary problem. It's an attempt to solve a problem. And then the real question is, how did the problem arise? In other words, this is where my theory is that it's always rooted in childhood trauma and that the addiction is an attempt to deal with the effects of childhood trauma, which it does temporarily, while it creates even more problems in the long term. And so the issue is not just to recognize what happened 10, 15, 30, however many years ago, but to actually recognize their manifestations in the present moment and to transcend them. And how do you do that? By reconnecting with yourself, by restoring the connection with your body primarily and with your emotions that you lost. <clears throat> and once you do, when you found these things again, then you have what we call recovery. Because what does it mean to recover something? It means to find it again. So what is it that people find when they recover? They find themselves. And the loss of self is the essence of trauma. So the real purpose of, 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 of addiction treatment, mental health treatment, any kind of healing is reconnection. All right, so, <clears throat> I mean, we have there like 
an entire um, semester's worth of material that we could delve into, right? Um, he's basically saying that um, we have this, this biological evolutional, evolutionary, you know, some would say spiritual need to connect with other people, right? And to feel um, understood um, by those people. And what can happen um, in some relationships is that that need um, conflicts with our ability to be our authentic selves because whatever um, dysfunction ex exists in relationships, there's always dysfunction in some relationships, but some histories of trauma or um, you know, intergenerational kind of um, violence produces dysfunctional relationships where our need for attachment um, takes precedence over our being our authentic selves, essentially being true to who we feel we are. And so we just lose connection with ourselves, right? We become dislocated. Um, and when that's the case, we try to fill, um, fill that hole with something else, right? And that um, is an addiction. And you notice that he said he wasn't talking only about drugs. There's a whole bunch of other addictions that can um, result from that. So if that if, if that um, sense of being disconnected from society, from relationships, from the world um, is, is what we want to talk about as dislocation, what produces that, okay? And um, here's where I'm going to get um, super political, so um, feel free to tune me out if you like at this point. But um, I mean, basically, uh, I, However you want to interpret or view capitalism as an economic um, system, what is absolutely clear is that in the years leading up to and following the Industrial Revolution, and some could argue even still to this day, right, um, Britain and other European colonies who are sort of spearheading those um, societal and industrial changes accumulated massive amounts of wealth, right? So that there wouldn't, it wouldn't have been possible to embark on such an ambitious um, program of manufacturing and stuff if there wasn't a whole bunch of accumulated wealth, right? So this accumulated wealth formed the capital which funded the industrial revolution. And how was this accumulated? Well, there was three basic things that it was accumulated by colonialism, um, slavery, and the enclosure movements, okay? And what do all of these things have in common? And the answer is that they produce dislocation on a massive scale, okay? We're talking like on a worldwide scale, um, more than had, I, I think, probably ever been, um, ever happened before, at least in such a short period of time, right? I'm not, so I'm not, not saying like capitalism is, responsible for every single bad thing in the world, um, but I'm saying that um, it produces a specific kind of effect that has this particular, um, that leads to this particular psychological trauma, which is this dislocation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about just some of that, just briefly summarize it. So imperialism and colonialism um, were real key to the accumulation of wealth by um, the European um, imperial powers. So from 1400 to 1900, the European states um, have been responsible um, either directly or indirectly through um, you know, spreading of disease um, or things like that for the deaths of around, according to some um, estimates, 150 million indigenous people in the Western hemisphere, okay? That I mean, I guess the um, the ultimate form of dislocation is death, right? Um, you're completely removed from your social, familiar, familial, and world context. You're just not there anymore. Um, and this was a direct result of this imperialism and colonialism. Okay, around 13 million people were enslaved and taken from Africa to the Americas to work um, for free to generate profits. Um, which were uh, which were largely 
shipped back over to, to the European powers. Um, in our own area of the world, at least 20,000 indigenous Australian people and 20,000 Maori were killed in the early years of colonialism. Those are some probably conservative estimates. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I mean, we're just, we're talking about um, trauma that's hard to sort of fathom, right? Um, in India, between 100,000 and 10 million, that's a huge variation in estimates, but um, those numbers are still kind of being ironed out, were killed um, or displaced by, by the British in the 1700s and 1800s. And um, in the 20th century, between 80 and 100 million people have been killed by um, communist dictatorships which have been dedicated to rapid industrialization and urbanization. Okay, so I'm not saying it's only a capitalist thing, but I am saying it's a it's a feature of um, governments and economic policies that prioritize the generation of profits and accumulation of wealth over um, the well-being of uh, citizens, non-citizens, other people, humanity in general, right? Um, <clears throat> and um, so I'm not even going to talk about, um, well, not, not yet, but, um, you know, what's happening with, like, climate change and things and um, the, the, glo the, the globalization movement is, is doing this on a large scale as well um, to um, indigenous people and displacing a lot of people so that corporations can come in and establish free trade areas or, um, you know, pri privatize various um, aspects, various lands um, and different countries and, and all of this stuff. So it's still ongoing. Um, but this is this is um, this this is what's what kind of happened in the lead up to sort of the Industrial Revolution before all of this got sort of really going. OK, so what about a cl enclosures? Now, this is something that's really um, interesting that happened over in Europe. Um, so what happened was um, the feudal system sort of dissolved um, over the course of a few centuries. Um, peasants started kind of agitating for more rights and things. There are a lot of other um, political and social um, events that happened. But what basically ended up happening is that, um, you know, serfs uh, or peasants were given their own plot of land to work, um, which they could work for their subsistence and that of their families. And over generations, these were sort of viewed as an inheritance, right? So you could pass these plots of land down to your um, families, and that would provide a subsistence for you and your families, right? And you and you had this this existence where you were working on the land, and you were um, you were uh, sharing common lands, forests, streams, ponds, um, places of waste. Um, where you could gather wood and other things and berries, you know, things that would, would help you and your family subsist. Um, well, what happened was beginning in the 15th century, the lords and the landowners um, basically began this movement to privatize the commons and turn it into farmable land because there was, um, you know, this was a ramp up to the Industrial Revolution. Manufacturing was beginning to take priority. Um, they were moving from this kind of um, market, like like manor based economy, which were where products were basically generated on these individual manors and and sold within the country to a more export based economy, right? So all of this stuff um, leads to this priority of generating as much um, profit as possible. And the way that you do that is you privatize all of the lands and you turn them into this farmable um, stuff, right? And so, of course, they started to privatize all of these common areas, which the peasants relied on for subsistence. Um, and this was known as an, an, an enclosure movement. Okay, so um, between the 15th and 18th centuries, millions of acres of common land was enclosed. Um, this stripped the peasants of their land and subsistence, forced a lot of them into cities. The population of London went from 600,000, or I think from 200,000 in um, 
in like 1400 to almost a million um, at the beginning of 1800. Um, and these peasants, of course, it's well documented that the life of a, a worker in um, 18th century London was just atrocious, right? And we've already seen how a lot of them turned to gin, um, which was very cheap at that time to, um, to sort of drown their sort of sorrows in that way. So that's a general overview of what the enclosure movement consisted of. Um, there was one particularly brutal um, uh, instance of enclosures which happened in Scotland um, called, called the Highland Clearances. I don't know, maybe you guys have heard about these, but we'll watch um, just a brief video um, about those. Um, so these happened in the 17th, 1700s and 1800s. This area of Scotland, called the Highlands, relative to the rest of Scotland, is very sparsely populated. In the mid-18th century, about 30% of Scots lived there. By the turn of the 20th, it was about 8%. So what happened? Well, the Highland clearances happened. So to give a bit of background, the early 18th century had seen a series of rebellions against British rule in Scotland in what are called the Jacobite Rebellion. These were where numerous Scottish clans, many of whom lived in the Highlands, maintained their loyalty to the House of Stuart who had previously ruled England, Scotland and Ireland until they got a bit too Catholic, which led to their deposition in the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And many in Scotland refused to acknowledge the new House of Orange and its successes and saw them as illegitimate rulers. When Scotland merged with England in 1707, its crowns merged too, and the Scottish clans took matters into their own hands. These rebellions were routinely defeated by the ever more professional British army and the government could see that there was only one way to prevent future uprisings, break the clan system. And the first way they could do this was by punishing the lords who had rebelled by depriving them of their lands and giving them to loyal subjects. These subjects, while most of them were Scottish, spent the majority of their time in London and over the generations they had less and less in common with their ancestral homeland, which is where economic developments come in. At this point, Britain was in the initial stages of the Industrial Revolution, which saw a greater number of people move to towns and cities for work. These people needed to be fed, and so farmlands were transformed to become more efficient. Thus, the Lords of the Highlands endeavoured to make their lands more economically valuable by turning them into massive sheep farms because of money. The problem was that people already lived there and farmed it for themselves, and legally, the land was theirs in common. But this problem was quickly solved by changing the law. And so began the Highland Clearances, whereby men and soldiers under the command of the nobility would forcibly evict people from their homes. And to stop them from returning, their houses would be burned down, and over the course of a century, over 100,000 people were left homeless and destitute. Now, there's a commonly held idea that the clearances were undertaken mostly by English lords, but this isn't true. The majority were Scottish, but the worst offender was an Englishman, hence the belief. This man was the Duke of Sutherland, although at this point he was only a Marquis like some sort of a peasant. And his eviction shouldn't be seen as just economic dislocation. This was the focused and near absolute obliteration of a lifestyle and culture which had existed since before records began. So what happened to these dispossessed people? Well, they were simply left to their own devices and they didn't have many choices. For many, the only alternative was emigration. So they headed for the New World, often the United States and Canada, but many went to Australia and New Zealand too. But how could they afford the journey there if they were left penniless? Well, their choice was simple, potential starvation or indentured servitude. In the end, the highlands were left sparsely populated and even the sheep which replaced the people also disappeared because the farms there weren't able to compete with the lamb and wool industries from New Zealand, many of whom's farmers were, ironically, the descendants of those who were killed from the highlands. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you. All right, so that's like a whirlwind tour um, of the highland clearances. Um, <clears throat> Basically, um, yeah, over 100,000 of these people were, were just cleared out um, to make room for, for sheep farms over there. Um, and, you know, you can, I, I think it's hard to sort of put into words or portray like the absolute trauma and horror that these, this scenario um, produced for a lot of people. Um, I mean, imagine watching, you know, watching your home be burned to the ground. You know, there's accounts of people who um, were, were too slow to get out of their house. Their house was started on fire before they got out of the house. Somebody was too old and infirm to move. Um, they're, you know, they would just be um, burned in their house. Like it's, it's just horrific, um, the kinds of things that happened here. Um, 
and and this is where this is where I think this this whole idea um, of trauma comes in, right? Intergenerational trauma, because um, when you're the when you are the product of the child um, of somebody who has undergone this kind of thing, that does something um, to the individual. I mean, one, one um, there was one account of um, a girl who um, just remembers uh, her grandmother um, was just sad and depressed like her entire life that this, that this little girl knew her. And when she would, she would ask her mom, like, well, what's wrong with grandma? She would just say, she, you know, she just was remembering this stuff. I mean, this is the post-traumatic stress disorder, right? The trauma that carries on does not just affect the individual that it happens to, but it affects generations. Um, and, and I mean, imagine being forced to leave um, the, a, a place where you and your family have lived for generations. I mean, talk about dislocation, right? You're completely removed from a place, um, from your place of, of living, from your society, um, from your world. And you, you feel like you completely um, don't belong anymore. Um, and in terms of colonialism, um, you know, in many instances, you know, those, those, those indigenous people um, were, if they weren't just straight up killed, they were forced to dislocate, uh, to, to remove themselves. They were pushed out of their ancestral lands. They were forced into um, these real, you know, squalid um, conditions, communities were given the worst parts of the country to try to, to scrape together a living. Um, you know, Alexander in that article talks a little bit about the Highland clearances, and he says that a lot of the Scots who were evicted went over to Canada, right, and settled in Vancouver and that area. And he talks about Vancouver as this sort of um, this city based on dislocated people, right? There's the Scottish people there. There's the um, Chinese people there who were there for gold mining and stuff. And um, same thing happened in California, right? There's people who have left their country, their home of origin to come somewhere else, already dislocated and then discriminated against when they get there. Um, and, you know, so what I'm trying to sort of illustrate is just the, the amount of, of trauma that can result from this type of a process over generations, right? And this kind of trauma is, is written into people's um, genetic makeup over time, right? And they're passing it down to their, their children. And there's just this brief video here um, made by an Australian group that talks um, about the effects of colonialism on um, this, this idea of intergenerational um, trauma. So we'll watch this briefly. The story of our communities, people, and nation starts a long, long time ago. More than 60,000 years, in fact. This was when our culture and our law first started to thrive. We knew who we were and where we belonged. We took care of each other, our land and our waters. We ate food that made us healthy, lived on country and abided by our laws and song lines. Our families, our children were happy with strong minds and hearts because they were where they belonged. But then everything changed. Colonization came, bringing wars, disease, famine, 
violence and the destruction and violation of our cultural laws, sacred sites, families and communities. We were denied our knowledge, language, ceremonies and identity. The very things that tell us who we are and where we belong and our connections with each other and the land grew weak. And then our children were taken from us. They had their names changed and their identities stripped away. They were told that Aboriginal people were bad. Worse still, they were told that their parents and grandparents would not want them. For years this happened and those children became known as the Stolen Generations. Our children were denied love and experienced physical, emotional and sexual abuse. This left very deep, very complex and very real wounds, leaving scars that are still being felt personally, socially, spiritually and collectively. In the time when our story started, we were able to parent in the cultural way that has seen our family survive and thrive for generations. Our people were strong and our culture flowed and healed us in times of hurt. But since the trauma of colonisation and the stolen generations, we have not been able to heal in the same way. And we have unknowingly passed this trauma on to our children through sharing our sad stories and having them witness and experience our pain. This is known as intergenerational trauma, and we see symptoms today in broken relationships, disconnected families, violence, suicide, and drug and alcohol abuse. But this is not where our story ends. We still have strong minds and hearts, and we still know who we were and where we belong by creating safe and strong communities together, supporting our families to be free from pain, returning to our culture and building the strength of identity, we can stop the cycle of trauma and bring about positive intergenerational change so that we can continue to thrive for the next 60,000 years. There are simple things that we can all do to help heal our trauma. Visit healingfoundation.org.au <laughs> All right, so that's just... Um a bit of a um, a bit of a illustration of some of the the kinds of things that have happened to um, indigenous people uh, throughout the world that focused on, on Australia, but the same kind of thing happened here in New Zealand. Um, the same kind of thing happened in um, the Americas and in um, in Canada. Um, so let's take a break, um, come back in 10 minutes and um, we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll um, pick it up from there in, in a few minutes, so. All right, um, <clears throat> we'll keep going here. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, um, I'm just get this sharing again. Um, <clears throat> when you think about sort of the populations um, in society that are most um, represented in, um, in those that use drugs, um, you think about these populations, right? So we know that rates of drug use and addiction are much higher in populations that have a history of being colonized or discriminated against. So. Um, Native Americans, Maori, um, indigenous people in Australia, um, other people, all, uh, the, the, these, these populations all have higher rates of drug use. And, um, you know, one way of thinking about it is that it's partially a result of this sort of intergenerational trauma that has resulted um, from um, these, these acts of colonization. And it's, um, <clears throat> you know, Bruce Alexander in, in his article and, and in this, his book, he talks a lot about um, Vancouver and parts of Canada that have, um, that, that are, that have really high rates of drug use and addiction um, and really high rates of people who have been um, dislocated, high rates of immigrants, 
um, who were forced out of their um, original homes and high rates of um, indigenous people, um, indigenous um, you know, Canadians who um, were forced out um, or otherwise abused by um, the colonial system. And it's quite interesting these days um, and in, in recent decades, um, as more and more um, sort of diverse voices have um, been raised um, in this in scholarly disciplines um, and people have tried to study this in sort of um, empirically rigorous ways the ways that people are are um, characterizing the effects of this type of a um, of a trauma and um, <clears throat> this video is is one um, one um, scholars um, journey, uh, attempt to do do such a thing so um, I think we have time to watch it. Um, so I'm just gonna play it. It's kind of long, but um, yeah, we'll just we'll just go for it. Mm. Of First Nations people in this province, we only make up roughly 3% of the overall population, but we make up over 13% of overdose deaths. I'll say that again. 3% of the overall population, over 13% of overdose deaths. Ace Whale, good day everyone. My name is Len Pierre. My ancestral name is Kalikula. I am Coast Salish from Cape Sea First Nation on my father's side and Muskegon First Nation on my mother's side, which is one of the host territories on which we are. Sorry, I'll get some closed captions up here. We're gathered today. I am a father, a loving partner, a traditional knowledge keeper in my community. I am also an indigenous or an instructor in indigenous education. I teach indigenous history, indigenous culture, and contemporary issues within the healthcare setting and within the university setting. And through this work, I have found an incredible value in what I call a bridging of worlds, a bridging of realities. And to me, that is what decolonization is all about. To me, decolonization is about the deconstruction, dismantling, and disrupting cultural barriers that separate us, suppress us, and quite often oppress us. Decolonization is really about expanding our social perceptions. And if you will allow, tap into our Indigenous worldview about matters so complicated and complex, such as talking about drugs. And if you don't think that drugs is complicated, talking about drugs is complicated and complex, at your next family dinner, there's a little bit of hesitation there because we don't want to spoil the, the mood at the dinner table. That's the essence of our talk and conversation today, is how are we going to continue this conversation in a good way amidst an overdose crisis? through an indigenous worldview. Because within our worldview, there's something to be gained and something to be learned. There's an ancient wisdom and a breadth of knowledge that can contribute to very important societal matters that we talk about across the globe. Matters of social justice and matters of environmental protection. Now I can go on and on and on and on about the, the value and, and benefits of decolonial work. That's a whole other TED talk. Today, I would like to talk about decolonizing substance use and addiction. Now, I'd like to take a moment to separate those two for you. I think quite often you hear about them and they are used interchangeably, but a big part of our work today is differentiating the two. And I'm going to use this as an example. How many of you have heard of the overdose crisis in the media? So, hands. Almost all of us. Where is the media really good at telling us that this 
types of subscriptions in large cities, back alleyways, and within the homeless population, right? We lose roughly four people a day in this overdose crisis. Now that may or may not seem like a large number to you, but those four people a day over the span of a year add up to over 1,500 British Columbian citizens. 1,500. A big part of our work today moving forward is carrying on a conversation. If we are not talking about this, we are not exchanging life-saving facts, factual information that can save lives and drastically reserve, uh, change the tide of this overdose crisis. So decolonization work is also really about destigmatizing substance use. Because at the end of the day, stigma is our real enemy here. Nobody wants to come out and say, have a conversation about drugs out of fear of the stigma associated with it. Therein, we cannot have a safe conversation. Stigma is a really real enemy here. And for us as Indigenous folks, we have a few lessons that we've learned about social stigma. What have we learned? We learned that stigma really requires four key things to survive. Lack of context, misinformation, I also call them myths, discriminatory language, and bad policy. I was trying to come up with some really good scholarly and professional way of spreading bad policy, but it's just bad policy. So how do we go about moving forward in a good way? We want to destigmatize. And again, reflecting on what we've learned with an indigenous perspective, what is our lack of contact? If we're overrepresented in overdose, substance use, and death, what is our missing contact? We take colonialism as one of the root causes of addiction. We highlight three colonial events, the residential school, the 60s scoop, and land theft. Now, us as Indigenous folks, we have survived, or endured many, many, many colonial events, but for this uh, activity, we'll only focus on these three. Each colonial event will leave behind certain residues, I call them. So for the residential schools, in case you're not familiar with them, was a Canadian assimilation policy implemented by the government of Canada and religious churches. And this assimilation policy, what it did is it removed every single Indigenous child from their communities and put them in boarding school for 10 months out of the year. This occurred through the ages of 6 to 16, roughly. And during our children staying in schools, it was quite the norm, it was quite common for our children to experience sexual and physical torture, starvation, and in some cases, being beaten to death by the staff. This was in place for well over 100 years from coast to coast. Tell me that doesn't leave certain residues behind in the community after 100 years. I call them residues. What are the residues that we see left in communities? A sense of fear, usually towards authority figures and institutions. A sense of shame, usually internally. And a sense of learning helplessness, which really instills a sense of hopelessness. And from the 60s, how many of us are familiar with the 60s? Not a lot of us. That's okay, that's why I'm here. In the 1960s, when the residential schools were slowly being phased out, the Canadian government and all its colonial brilliance implemented a new assimilation policy that would continue to remove Indigenous children from their families and their communities. And instead of putting them in boarding schools, put them in the foster care system. Often, never with valid reasons for the forced removal of children, our children will, and without intention of returning these children home. Our children were often sent south of the border and in some cases sent across the ocean to other continents. When I stand here, my elders remind me that when we were doing this talk, it's important to remind us as a community that just because this is called the 60s group doesn't mean it ended in the 1960s. We have more children in the foster care system today than have ever attended the residential school at the peak of its operation. 
what do we think uh, residues are left behind after this colonial event? Sense of isolation, loss of identity, and most definitely, the loss of it. And from land theft, where we take our traditional territory of what we used to use to sustain it and we reduce it to less than 0.5%, what are the residues that are left behind? Poverty, lack of housing, and loss of food. Now, if we were to pool all those residues together and give them a theme, what would we call them? We call them a sense of trauma, grief, loss, and a sense of daily stress. Now, I look to you and I ask, can we agree that trauma, grief, loss, and daily stress are drivers and reinforcers for addiction? Are we relationship then? Yeah. If this is our missing context, so if you have it within community-based conversations with your friend group or your family group that addiction is a choice, I invite you now to remove that from your vocabulary and your conversations that we do not choose to be addicted. We use addiction to feel good about something very bad that is happening. This is the missing conversation. These are difficult conversations to have. I know. Look at me, I'm sweating. Um, but this is really how we expand our social perception by sitting in our own discomfort for as long as we can possibly bear it, listening, learning, and then validating that information. This is the missing context. After missing context, substance use, uh, stigma with a substance use needs a whole lot of missing information to survive. I call it misinformation mountain because it's way too easy to pick up our phone open up our social media app and be exposed to all kinds of incorrect information. Um, I have one I'll share with you. I hear this all the time and it goes like this. We just need to pick out all the people who sell drugs out of the community. That'll solve the problem. Sound familiar? That is a microcosm of Canada's war on drugs. Only if we take on a war on drugs, do you think that drugs can pick up a weapon and fight you back? No. This is a war on our own people. Only that war on our own people are the most marginalized and vulnerable sectors of our community. At the end of the day, what we know for sure is that prohibition is a failed policy and bad policy. And prohibition is it doesn't work. It's a failed experiment. And it's easy to Think about this. If we think back to um, the United States in the early 1930s when alcohol was prohibited, during or before prohibition, what do we think the number one alcohol was that was consumed? Beer. During prohibition, what do you think the number one alcohol was that was consumed? Moonshine. Moonshine. Prohibition equals potency and it doesn't work. So if you encounter that, that, that myth, that misinformation, I also invite you to cross check to decide if it's inaccurate information or it doesn't work. The accurate information is that prohibition doesn't work. Lack of context, misinformation, discriminating language. If there's one thing, one thing you walk away with from this talk, please, please let it be re examining and reusing and rethinking the way we use language when we talk about drugs, substance use, and addiction. Because what do we often hear? When we're talking about people who use substances, we often hear the term user, addict, or junkie. And I say that this is really important because language, the language we use, has this funny relationship in our brain that constructs our thoughts, and our thoughts construct our beliefs, and our beliefs are going to inform how we treat people who are using substances. So what I say is, Use people's first language. People who use drugs, people who drink, people who smoke. Because we don't want to be defined by our behavior. We want to be defined by people first. And again, from our indigenous community, we've learned a thing or two. We've had all sorts of derogatory terms that have been applied to us over the years. Words that will not even utter on a public stage like a TED Talk. So please, please, if there's one thing that you take away, let us be reusing or rethinking the way we talk about substance use and people who are using Because it's demonizing language, really, at the end of the day. After 
in meeting language to that policy. So I've already mentioned that prohibition uh, is a failed experiment. Uh, prohibition is also rooted in racism. So to kind of frame this piece of the conversation, we the overdose crisis is also referred to as the opioid crisis. Opioids are nothing new. Opioids have been used for a very, very long time. So when, where, and why did opioid, opioid use become illegal? Again, coming back to our local neighborhood here in downtown Vancouver, um, who built the Canadian Railway? Asian immigrants. And when the Canadian Railway was built, or finished, and completed in the early 1900s, we had a massive unemployment problem. So what happened was that there were race riots in downtown Vancouver. And Mucky Association has accounts of this, where gas towns burned down. Um, and so what happened? The Minister of Labor at the time, who was later to become Prime Minister, comes all the way up from Ottawa to downtown Vancouver, sees that there's a race problem, goes all the way back to Ottawa and implements and births the policy for prohibiting opioid use for the Asian population. All prohibition policies are rooted in racism. If any drug is uh, find out the source of origin, it's going to come from racism ideology. The thing about policy is that there's a little bit of good news. It has two creating policies. We do. You. Me. We. Us. We create this policy. And policy can be changed. Countries around the world, they have already abolished their prohibition policy by decriminalizing people who use substances. Our own provincial health officer in British Columbia has made this call. Put a call out for the decriminalization of people who use substances. We waste millions and millions and millions of dollars a year on the war on drugs. Imagine what healing could transpire if we invested that money into prevention, harm reduction, and treatment. I raise my hands to each and every one of you for picking up the fight of colonial harm that harm Canadian women, LGBTQ, folks, people of color, people with disabilities, and people who use drugs. If there's one thing that you're looking for today, please let it be continuing on this conversation, but applying it with a decolonial lens. And you can see what we've learned as an Indigenous community over the years is that we can transform the direction of our community by reconstructing the way we are talking about our trauma and spin them in a positive direction, a direction that is inclusive, compassionate to our fellow citizens, and engaging to the folks who this topic matters most, to love and care for wholeheartedly. I accept this email. Thank you. All right, so um, I really like that video. I think um, the the presenter is very eloquent in in the way that he talks about um, the sort of he calls them residues, right? The sort of long term effects of these policies um, that are rooted in the sort of colonial mindset, um, and you wonder why you know. Native Americans or indigenous indigenous Canadians or Maori or other people are so overrepresented in in the the, the populations of, of people who use drugs. I mean, it's just they're carrying a, an almost unbelievable weight of all of this stuff that's that's happened over generations, right? Um, and this. So, so this is just um, <clears throat> this is basically just uh, capitalism getting going, right? I mean, when we're talking about colonialism from the 1400s to the 1900s or so, um, and all the stuff that happened even in Britain, like with the enclosure movements and and all of this stuff, um, this is this is like this is leading up to and a part of the industrial revolution 
which was when the sort of classical um, economics and, and free market sort of thinking came, came into play. Um, so, so this isn't even, we're not even talking about today, right? I mean, we're talking about the, the effects of this stuff um, on, on generations removed from the people that it's happened to, right? I mean, in some cases, uh, I mean, I guess I don't want to downplay um, and, and uh, suggest that the trauma is a long ways in the past, because I know that there are people who have grandparents, for example, who were put in these kind of boarding schools or punished for using um, their, their original language and things like that. So, so these things are, are still very much ongoing. The trauma is very much ongoing. But what I want to talk about now is how um, capitalism, by its very nature, produces dislocation, okay, as a function of it, the ideology that goes along with it. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, economics. Um, <clears throat> so the, the idea that Adam Smith and other sort of classical economists um, came up with when they were talking about free market um, economics was this idea of the invisible hand, right? Maybe you've heard of this before. Um, and the invisible hand is, um, it's the market, right? If you have, if, if you just let, um, prices fluctuate according to demand. And if you let supply um, be dictated by how much demand there is, that doesn't require any kind of um, regulation. That's the invisible hand of the market, right? Um, it's, it's this kind of, this invisible process that just balances things out and makes the free market um, economy work, right? So the invisible hand of the market dictates prices, production of commodities, um, supply, demand, all of that stuff. No, no outside control of the labor required, right? Because if more people want a certain commodity, more people are going to be making that commodity. So there's going to be more jobs in that sector. Um, there doesn't need to be any, any um, outside uh, rec um, regulation of land or consumer goods. It's all based on supply and demand. And this happens outside of, of um, government regulation. Right, and, and the other thing um, about the, the fundamental notion behind capitalism is that it assumes that in our deepest human nature, we are individual actors working to maximize our own profits in society, or not, not profits, but our own benefits, right? So if we're talking about relationships, um, we're, we're looking, we're, we're in, in relationships to maximize whatever we can gain out of any kind of scenario in society. And it assumes that everybody in the world or in a given society acting in their own self-interest will lead to the greatest good for society, okay? So with this notion, any kind of cooperation or reciprocity is it's antithetical to this notion, right? Because in order for the market to work, every person has to pursue their own self-interest, regardless of what is good for those around them in their family or society. And so we have to, you have to put relationships which require cooperation or sacrifice on the back burner. And those have to take second place to your own self-interest, right? This, this, this is a principle of free market economics that is assumed to be a reality in human existence, okay? And so what, when you view a population, humanity in this way, what kind of a system do you set up? So this is, this is from Bruce Alexander. Um, Free markets require that participants take the role of individual economic actors in unencumbered by family and friendship obligations, clan loyalties, community responsibilities, charitable feelings, the values of their religion, ethnic group, or nation. And it is assumed in order for this, this free market to work, 
it is assumed that no loyalties or relationships will compete with each individual's own self-interest. Okay, so this is the underlying logic of, of the system. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, it doesn't take a, a genius to, to see how, whether or not it's conscious, um, how the perpetuation of this system over the last couple hundred years has atomized um, the public and separated us from our relationships, okay? So just as one example, it, since the 1950s in the States, because that's where I come from and because this is where a lot of the sort of free market um, ideology is just really, really entrenched. Um, the US experienced um, an economic boom, which was ironically um, in response to government regulation um, but basically what happened was the, the government um, started putting um, policies in place which guaranteed um, job security and good wages and things like that. And so there was this kind of burgeoning middle class, which was good for a lot of people. But then people started moving out of the cities into suburbs, which a suburb is a place where you have large houses on large um, sort of uh, uh, tracts of land, and you have these people who are composed in relatively autonomous nuclear families, right? Um, so throughout history, um, uh, people have mostly lived in sort of um, intergenerational families where you have um, a husband and wife, the mom and dad, the brothers and sisters, everybody kind of living together, if not in the same house, in the same community and kind of helping one another out. Um, but as people started, became more affluent, people started living in these relatively autonomous nuclear families. So single families living in large homes with lots of land, income and wealth for the middle class increased. People in suburbs become relatively isolated from their neighbors. I mean, some people still have, you know, community events and things, but the, the cooperation that was required um, uh, to live in, in previous times was no longer necessary when people became so affluent, right? So there's no real incentive to interact with or form relationships or work with the community. People become their own island, right? Um, and and the other thing about um, the other thing about um, free market uh, societies, economic systems is because they're always looking to maximize profits, no matter what they commodify everything, right? And so in our current society, um, even relationships have been commodified, right? So social media um, commodifies interaction and relationship, um, which is uh, more and more becoming a substitute for real relationship, right? So, um, and I'm not um, gonna sit here and say that I think social media is the big problem that's, you know, that's causing all of the issues with society, because I think it's much deeper than that, obviously, right? We're sitting here talking about capitalism. But um, the, the, the problem with social media is the way that it substitutes for real relationship, right? And, and as companies, as social media companies learn more and more about the nuances of the way that people interact, they are commodifying those things even more and more, right? So the interact, the, the buttons that, um, you know, you have the emojis, the responses to whatever, the hearts, the likes, the hugs, all of that stuff is taking the place of real, actual relationships, right? And, and the more you can um, simulate a relationship in that artificial world of social media, the less people actually need the real thing or the less they think they need the real thing, which is, um, is not the case. So, so this whole idea of the free market, of people being individual actors, of people becoming atomized by um, relatively more affluence, people becoming separated because of um, the way that companies are commodifying things in an artificial way, this is dislocation, right? This, this is what we've been talking about happening today. Um, and a lot of these things are taking place against the background of a colonial 
trauma, right, in these populations that are most um, susceptible to addiction. Okay, so of course, well, what do you have? So I mean, we've talked a lot about, um, so we haven't talked much about addiction, right? We've talked um, about imperialism, colonialism, enclosures, um, trauma, and um, so this is this is what I what I said. My goal was trying to set the stage for talking about addiction, right? This is the context in which we can understand addiction. So, what about addiction? Well, let's just go through. Um, let's just let's just um, breeze through some stats here. Okay. Well, this is social media use. So, number of people using social media platforms from 2004 to, to a couple of years ago, 2018. You can see that it's just increasing, right? Um, Facebook uh, seems to be um, at the top of the pile, but you have tons of people on YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, all of these other ones. TikTok um, these days would probably be real high, um, especially with like um, the, the teen community. So social media use has um, just, just gone um, increased like crazy, right? And of course, this is pretty interesting because I don't know if you've been following, but in the last week, there was a whistleblower from Facebook who um, basically published thousands of pages of internal memos, which were basically um, saying, showing that Facebook um, knowingly pushes um, applications and um, ways of engaging users, which are harmful because it generates revenue. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about with a capitalist society that prioritizes profits over people. You have companies that know they are marketing content to teenage girls that produces anorexia and self-loathing and all of this stuff, but they keep it up because it generates them huge amounts of profits. Okay, so the people are, are um, becoming addicted to social media, according to these numbers. Um, here's just another one um, from 2006 to 2018, number percentage of U.S. adults who say they use social media sites, um, 18 to 29 year olds are um, by far the, the biggest um, group here, but you have everybody is kind of getting in on the game, right? Um, everybody's using social media. It's a good way to connect with people, not in a... Um, real meaningful way, but for people who are separated or, um, you know, live overseas or something like that, there are, there are valid uses for it. But um, yeah, so social media use um, is increasing. Um, pornography. Um, so there's just millions of people who, who use pornography and we're not going to get into sort of any of the um, moral arguments, whether or not you think it's a good idea. But the, what I'm just trying to point out is that there are an increasing number of people using it, okay? Um, and these are, and a lot of these people are, um, um, the stats are kind of hard to come by because the study of these things as addictions, um, quote unquote addictions is still relatively new. But um, a lot of these people use, um, um, you know, social media or pornography to the extent that um, it's impacting other, other areas of their life. Okay, so this is just another um, one from a certain period of time showing an uptick in, um, in male and female um, identifying users of pornography, right? So um, that's on the increase. Um, gambling is on the increase. So this is just showing um, a, a few different indexes of um, of gambling. So for example, Australia, um, according to this, has the biggest um, loss per resident adult in terms of dollars. So uh, maybe they're not gambling the most, but they're losing the most money, um, according to this analysis. And you see um, that the, uh, the forecast when, when this um, analysis came out was that it would just keep going up all these different kinds of gambling, casino, gambling machines, betting, lotteries, interactive, other gambling, online gambling is, is increasing in frequency. So this is 2003 to 2017. You can see the actual um, numbers um, 
are a little bit different than the forecast, but they are increasing, right? All of them are increasing on an upward tra trajectory. So a lot of people are gambling, um, presenting to psychologists or psychiatrists with problematic gambling, losing huge amounts of money, ruining their relationships. Um, shopping addiction, right, is actually a thing now that people are talking about. Um, so signs of shopping addiction, overspending, compulsive purchases, chronic shopping, lying about spending, emotional spending, ignoring consequences, shopping guilt. Um, these things are, are coming into the popular consciousness, right? People are engaging in these types of behaviors to the extent that they are distressing to the individual, and so they're seeking help, right? So these things are coming into um, our societies in ways that they have not done so historically. Um, whether or not it's because it was not so much a problem or people didn't feel like they could seek help, um, th these are still relatively new phenomena, right? Even if you say that they've um, happened within the last 100 or 50 years, um, you just don't have, historically, you just haven't had the saturation of commodities and products that would support this type of a um, this type of a quote unquote addiction, right? Or lifestyle. Food is another one. So people are talking a lot about food addiction, right? Um, obesity rates um, are, are just skyrocketing, um, particularly in Western countries. Um, you know, and there's an important discussion to be had about the way that we talk about obesity and people who are overweight, because there's a lot of, I think, misinformation and bad science and, and bad ideas around that. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, a lot of people are, are becoming overweight. Um, and a lot of it is just because people are eating huge amounts of junk food, right? Um, so uh, this is obesity rates by state in the US again, which is, um, seems to be like on the vanguard of like all the bad things that are happening in the world right now. Um, <clears throat> So obesity rates by state 2010, you can see that in most states, almost, you know, between 30 to 50% of people were, were um, diag or, or fit the criteria for obesity, whether or not you want to argue that those criteria are valid, um, a BMI of over 30, some people think the BMI is um, a crock, but well, whatever you think of that, this, this says that there's a lot of people in the states that, that are obese. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just lifestyle and eating um, bad food for you. This is the projected obesity rates by state in 2030. So now we're looking at between 40 and 60% of people in most states being um, fitting the criteria for obesity, right? Um, and a lot of it has to do with poverty because um, cheap, uh, cheap, you know, food that's um, mass produced and that has a lot of preservatives is a lot cheaper than buying healthy food. Um, so this is all, it's all tied up with this, um, with an economic system that um, prioritizes making money over the life, lives and livelihoods of people. But so obesity is a problem. Here's the share of adults that are overweight. Oh, so now we're just talking about overweight, being overweight or obese. This is in 2016. You can see that the US is right at the top there. Um, New Zealand and Australia, we have between 60 and 70% that could be considered overweight or obese, right? So there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, this, this kind of issue going on right now as well. Um, there's now a growing um, awareness or, or people um, recognizing that their relationship with sex is unhealthy. Um, and in, in particular, um, people who find themselves just pursuing a lot of sexual relationships outside of sort of a committed relationship. So just um, bouncing from person to person and of course, you, this is problematic because you, you can expose yourself to um, sexually transmitted diseases, um, um, exploitation in a number of different um, avenues. 
And um, of course, uh, you know, the sex act outside of a committed relationship um, has its own issues, right? Um, uh, you can, I'm not, I'm not um, levying any kind of moral judgment here. I'm just saying that it's, a, it's an extremely intimate thing to do with somebody. And so um, the way that you view that, um, that act can, can color um, the way that you view individuals and even yourself, okay? So, so what, are some, um, what are some signs of, of, of um, being addicted to sex? These are just some that I pulled off, okay? Feelings of guilt, shame, or remorse after sex, preoccupation with sex, obsessing over sexual fantasies, putting oneself or others in hazardous situations due to sexual behavior. So people are presenting um, to psychologists and clinicians with these types of, of lifestyles and behaviors. Um, this is just an indication of um, the interest um, in the scientific community about this, which is an indication of how much it's being um, presented as an issue with people who are concerned, right? So in 1995, um, you started having a trickle of publications, scientific publications about sex addiction. Um, but as you can see, we're almost at an exponential rise um, over the last 25 years. Um, so this is, this is becoming more of a thing, right? So all of these addictions, here's another one, exercise, people exercising for um, going to the gym for hours a day, um, right? Um, if, you're, if you're doing that and that's not your full-time job, um, uh, some people, you know, fit the criteria for an addictive, um, uh, an addiction to exercise. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, ideas around the relationship with this and, and eating disorders and stuff like that. So exercise is another one. TV, right? People used to, we used to call them couch potatoes when I was growing up. I don't know if people still call them couch potatoes, but people just watching things, right? We, we live in, a, um, in an age where you can watch just hours and hours of anything you want, any time of day, right? And when you finish one of those shows on Netflix, if you don't stop it before five seconds, you automatically go into the next episode, right? So people watching TV, and for those who don't actually watch TV, people watching their phones, kids are getting into this at younger and younger ages, right? And of course, these companies are marketing to young children so that they can get them hooked early. So they have all kinds of weird videos on YouTube, right? Where you can watch little kids opening presents and opening toys and just being real excited about all of these things. And not only does that get you addicted to TV, but that gets you addicted to buying stuff, right? And it and makes your kid want all of these new things. So, so there's TV addiction, right? Um, <clears throat> and that we're gonna end it there. And I want you guys to take me seriously. And so that is why I'm going to take some time digging into specifics next lecture. Because what I want to do is what I've said, okay, if, if this theory of dislocation is correct and capitalism as I've said it and understand it produces dislocation on a massive scale, we should see higher rates of drug use in places that are adversely affected by capitalism. But adversely affected by capitalism is a hard thing to quantify when you have several hundred years of these colonial and imperialistic events, which have just led to this intergenerational trauma. It's a hard thing to quantify, right? So colonialism has taken place over generations. And it's clear that people displaced by colonialism suffer addiction at higher rates than others. But there's a lot of other things going on in those people's lives, right? There's a lot of factors here. So what I want to ask, and this is what I'm going to get into next time, is can we point to something that doesn't take place on such a protracted time scale where we can point to something and say, here's some hard evidence that this particular population that was affected by something that is unique to free market capitalism shows higher rates of addiction. And so I'm gonna do that next time and um, hopefully uh, I can convince you guys. So 
we're going to stop there for today. Um, but email me any questions you have. Um, keep emailing me things about the analysis piece. Um, get it all finished up this week. And um, I will see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks, Ryan. Have a good Thanks, day. Ryan. Yep, we'll see you guys. See you. Thank you.